Well, good evening and welcome. I'm Nick Williams. I'm standing in still for our president, David Zerman. So we're gathered tonight on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation, and I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Warrenjeri to the north and the Bunurong to the south, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and to any Indigenous people who are with us tonight. A warm welcome to everybody. Now, the main event tonight, Dr Tian Huynh, we welcome very much. <laughs> Tian was born in Vietnam, emigrated to Australia as an asylum refugee from Vietnam War with no English speaking skills, nothing but the clothes she was wearing, and she really got hooked on science under the tutelage of amazing mentor Professor Anne Laurie. That was at Melbourne, was it? At RMIT, sorry. From there, she went on to complete her doctorate at Melbourne and postdoctoral research overseas in England and Italy in evolutionary phylogenetics and conservation biology. She's now back in Australia specialising in cancer, tissue repair, neuropharmacology and drug discovery technologies, and she's a senior lecturer in bioscience at RMIT. She's passionate about environmental sustainability, medicinal plants, and conservation. And recently she was recognized as a superstar of STEM, as ambassador and role model for all the new young women coming up. So I reckon she should stand for PM, apart from anything else. <laughs> so welcome very much, and we're pleased to listen to you. Thank you for that very kind introduction and everyone for your attendance. Um, now, first of all, I'm going to let you know why I'm wearing this, which is a traditional Vietnamese outfit. It's worn for special events and ceremonies, and I'm wearing it because it's a tribute to the plants that I'll be introducing you to today. So they're somehow connected to Vietnam, and especially Asia. And my purpose here is to let you know about what I think is the amazing world of nature and what it could do for us. Um, and I think there's so many opportunities that I see in terms of bringing my heritage and my cultural background and seeing these things with different eyes. And because my eyes come from Australia and I, I do want to acknowledge that Australia is my um, home, but I have a strong um, connection to Asia because that's where I was born. And coming from Australia with the knowledge that I have and the education that I have, I see things with a different perspective. And that opens up a whole new load of opportunities that I can see that we can benefit from together. Even though my home is in Australia, but my birthplace was Vietnam, I think it's quite a privilege because I have perspectives from many different places. I've grown up here and I know the, the culture very well, but going to Asia, there's a certain um, appreciation for the simple life. And I think, especially in Australia, we're so distracted with everything in front of us, with TVs, iPads, iPhones, internet, all that sort of stuff. We are so removed from the natural environment. And when I go to Asia, they don't have a lot of the money. They don't have a lot of the technology. And so it goes back to the, the raw selves, the natural environment. And I see certain happiness in that, that rarity that you have with the natural environment as opposed to from here and there. And I think that perspective is actually really good and I think the people also see me as one of them, whether it's Vietnam or Asia, because that's where I was born but I've been overseas doing all this studying, training to bring back these perspectives, this technology to help them. What I've got to start with is... Now, I really believe that nature is going to help us be a better world. It's got all the answers that we need. And um, there's a famous saying from Hippocrates that food can be your medicine, but it can also be a poison. It depends on how you take it. And in a world where we have so much available food, we're so under And that's not because we don't have the best 
um, food available, it might be that we're not actually absorbing it the right way or we're taking it the right way. So the first plant I'm going to show you, uh, highlight to you, is coffee. Hands up if you drink coffee. Keep your hands up if you think it's good for you. Well, there's some up and down, up and down. Or hands up if you only drink it because you like to and you don't really care about the benefits or not. <laughs> well, it's great. We all have something in common. Now, coffee is the second most popular drink in the world, second only to water. Now, there's 1.6 billion cups drank a day in the world. 1.6 billion Okay, now if you can imagine that, that's a lot of people consuming it. But did you know how it started? Well, coffee is actually originally from Ethiopia. And it was a goat herder who noticed that his goats were drinking, eating these little berries and they become very excited. <laughs> and so he's, he decided to brew it himself and he found that it was really good for concentration. It was quite a stimulant in terms of keeping him awake and, and aware of things. And the Arabs decided to, when they um, visited, they took the, the coffee and they started to cultivate it in different um, uh, regions. And that's why Coffee Arabica is one of the, mo uh, the main produced coffees because it's based on the Arabi Arabian distribution. Now, coffee itself, there's two main types. One's Coffee Arabica and one's Coffee Robusta. And you're going to know a lot more about coffee by the end of this, but you're going to also be thanking me for highlighting why it's so good. Brazil is one of the main producers of coffee, okay? But they produce mostly coffee arabica. Hands up if you like coffee arabica. Hands up if you don't know what coffee is you. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through it. So we work through this together. So coffee arabica, it's meant to have a more sweeter smell and a more well-bodied fragrance and flavor. Coffee Robusta is the other type of coffee that's produced, and Vietnam is the leading producer of Coffee Robusta. Now, Coffee Robusta is also the main uh, coffee that's produced in now instant coffees. Okay, so it means it's readily available from just a sachet. We don't need to grind it anymore. So the convenience means that we can have these two. The problem with coffee is that Coffee Arabica is very uh, reliant on specific conditions to grow, which means as the climate changes, is not going to be able to grow in many places and it's going to restrict the regions we can grow it and feed with 1.6 billion cups of coffee a day. So there might be mutiny in the future because we won't have enough highlands to grow the coffee. So that's where Robusta is really good because the name Robusta, if you shorten it down, it's robust. It can grow in a lot of different climates. So what that means is that Vietnam is future-proofing itself by allowing for it to grow the variety that will be good for climate change, that will be quite variable in terms of its, its distribution. Now, the reason why I asked you in terms of whether you know it's good for you or not, because I want you to be the most well-informed drinkers in the world. So this is just a, a, a screen print of one of the um, uh, internet sites that I looked at in terms of had these infographics, whether it's good or not for you. But how do you know the truth from the internet? Because there's so much information. But how do we know what's true? Well, what I've decided to do with a lot of our research is actually sort out fact from fiction. Last year in December 2018, the British Medical Journey came out with a metadata review of all the coffee uh, research that was produced. And what they concluded was that coffee is actually quite good for you. But only in moderation. But we also thought, well, we'll do some studies because I'm a scientist and I got my uh, collaborators and students to look at coffee and help me to decide myself in terms of why is it good, why is it not good. So we're going to go through this table together because it's a bit complicated. And at the top, I want you to look at the eight main compounds that I'm going to highlight because we went through all the literature and we decided to look at the main composition of coffee and see which one was actually good for us and which one was not. And I'm going to go through them slowly. So we know that triglycerides are actually associated with heart disease and stroke. So I've highlighted them in red if it's bad for you. The ones in green are good for you. The second one is trigonolene and 
it's meant to be neuroprotective, but only for specific people. So some different groups who have different conditions may not be suited for them, like diabetes, because it's associated with bone uh, density reduction. The next one is methylpyridine, pyridine, sorry, stimulates respiration and energy um, uh, uh, usage. We've also got formic acid, which is associated with antibacterial activity, but it's also quite volatile, which means it's the main compound that you smell. So it's actually good for that well-bodied smell that you can associate with. The next one is quite controversial. So I didn't highlight in red or green because it's both. And this is where that confusion comes in in terms of if you have too much of something it can be good or bad for you. And we know that caffeine is the main thing that we drink in terms of that a stimulation of alertness and cognitive function. It's also been associated with reductions in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but it's registered as a stimulant drug. You have too much of it and you get very buzzed. And you probably know that with those who drink more than four cups of coffee a day. The next one is acetic acid, and that's associated with reduced inflammation and reduced blood pressure. But it's also got high volatiles, which adds to that complexity that you can smell and taste when you have the coffee. Lactic acid is important for energy for the brain. Okay? Now, some people will associate lactic acid for when we do exercise and it builds up in our muscles. But the brain actually consumes a lot more energy than the rest of your body. So this source of high energy that's needed is actually really important for the brain. We also looked at chlorogenic acid, which binds to enzymes that are linked to Alzheimer's. So a lot of things there that we looked at was very related to brain health. And that's why the overall analysis by the British Medical Journal was that it's probably good for you, but only moderation. So I had three main studies. The one, first one was looking at the species between Robusta and Arabica. And we found that if you follow the whole thing, most of it's green for Arabica. So if you're going to have a choice, what would you drink? <laughs> Are you better informed to choose your coffee now? <laughs> the second thing we looked at, and I'm really passionate about this, is about sustainability, environmental sustainability. If we're producing 1.6 billion cups of coffee a day, can you imagine how much it takes to grow to make that? And along the way is the waste because we're putting a lot of water that we could drink instead into it, pesticides, insecticides, ground to grow crops that we could actually be um, using. So we looked at the coffee, and I'll skip through so you can show you the meaning behind this. This is coffee when it's in the green side on the, your left, am I right? So that's when it's on the, 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 the tree. And then as it ripens, it becomes more red. And then it dry, starts to dry out on the tree and becomes more brown on the top left there. So what we did was we separated them out from the pulp, which is the outside skin, to the husk, which is the protective layer inside that, to the green beans on the left over here. So when we looked at that, we saw that the, with the fresh fruit, they also have like a, quite a bit of composition in terms of the chlorogenic acid in the green beans. But most of the fruits that we're producing, if they're not perfect, they get thrown out. It's only the perfect beans that get to us if they're big enough, if they're ripe enough, if they're perfect. We throw out more than half of what's produced before it gets to us roasted. And the great thing is that if we can have green beans in the alternative, it's got high concentration of chlorogenic acid, which is, remember, good for the brain. And that's all wasted. The other part that I was looking at was also between the roasted beans that we drink and the ground, the spent beans. So when we put our beans into the, the espresso machine, all the liquid flows through and we throw out the rest, the bulkiness of it. Now there's a lot of coffee shops around that are actually giving away the ground beans for us to use, but it's got a lot of acidity in it and that's because of all the acids. And what that does is it makes your soil acidic. And so most plants will not be able to absorb the nutrients in the soil because of this acidity. And the acidity is also bad when it goes in waterways because of organisms. So we, we have a few things here in terms of understanding more about what we can do with this. And what I recommend with a lot of people taking the ground, the coffee grounds, 
is growing more acidic loving plants instead. Things like blueberries. Initially when I started my research, it was really to go see the farmers and how they produce these products. But along the process, I saw the waste and it was unexpected. I, as a scientist and a nature lover, I thought I'd be a lot more aware of it than that. And seeing all this waste, that's why I made it a determination of mine to see that others also see that waste through my eyes, my vision, my experiences, because most people wouldn't have the experience to actually go and pollinate their own orchids or, or you know, go to a farm where chocolate's made and see the process from the start to the end and the waste that's produced along the way. So for me, I feel very lucky to have been exposed to that and I feel it my, as my obligation to share with the public the foods that we're eating, the waste that's also generated on the side that we don't see. We also looked at different experiments and this is, um, we, we wanted to look at the brain effects. And this is uh, an experiment using astrocytes. Now your brains contain two different types of cells. One is neurons and the other one are astrocytes. Now the neurons are all the things that spark up when you talk, when it needs to talk to each other to send those signals. Astrocytes are cells that surround the neutron, neurons and so protect it and supplies energy to, for the brain to function. So we looked at the astrocytes and we wanted to know what was actually occurring when we added coffee to it. And we know that coffee is a stimulant. And as you can see, most of them with the cells that don't have anything in it, it's at pretty normal levels. When we added coffee, it spikes it up because it's stimulating that effect and that's the stimulation you get from drinking coffee. Robusta, Arabica, this is the spent coffee grounds, and this is the green beans. So they're still all stimulated. In the red, what we did was we stressed up these cells with hydrogen peroxide, stimulating the stressful condition. And we can show that the stress condition is very similar to when it's actually been um, introduced to coffee. So your brain is in this state of hyperactivity. Now the reason why this is important is because brain health is a really important thing to look at, at the moment. We are getting much older, and if you think about it, is there any machine we know that will go, well the average lifespan is about 80 years old. Do we have any machines that will go with warranty for 80 years without a need for a re replacement? I know my phones won't last for two years. But we, as human beings, are an, a machine. And to last that long with the wear and tear that we have is humongous. And our brain is running a lot of those functions. So as we get older, our brains are gonna be a little bit weaker. Okay, those synapses aren't gonna work as great. So the problem as we get older is that dementia and all related brain diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is going to become a big problem as we age as a population. In terms of cost, it's billions of dollars. Our brain health is really important. And we have an opportunity with coffee to actually take control and give ourselves the best chance to be much better thinkers when we're older. We also looked at the effect on wound healing, which is quite new. And we're trying to develop this as something to uh, use the waste as well. So remember how I showed you with the coffee had different components? the pulp, the husk, and the beans. Now, the beans you don't want to use because that's stuff we'll drink. I mean, that's the stuff we'll roast to drink. But the rest of the stuff that's thrown away, like the pulp and the husk, if you can imagine, it's more than 50% of the actual fruit. We're throwing away 50% of 1.6 billion cups a day. That's a lot of waste. But it has potential to heal us in terms of superficial wounds. So this is uh, skin cells, and you see if the top one is when it heals over, the bottom one's when it hasn't. So we have skin cells we grow, and we scratch it in terms of wounding, watch it as it heals. And we show that the pulp, the stuff we throw away, will increase the wounding process by more than double. So what we want to do is add that to a Band-Aid. That way you've got a really good healing process from a waste that would normally be thrown away like that. Now, I couldn't get any Australian statistics, so I gave you the British one, which is kind of okay, I think. The cost of wound care is third in the world. 
second to diabetes and cancer, worth billions of dollars. And that's an opportunity for medicine, for, for plant medicine to actually contribute towards. And it's something we throw away. Now, don't look at the slide. Before I go on to that, I don't want you to just be here listening to me go home and say, oh, that was interesting and that's the end of it. I want to give you a gift. So what I decided to do was give you a fact sheet as well as my own personalised recipe. This is for uh, meat lovers, but if you're vegetarian, what you can do is stuff the coffee inside bean uh, tofu or vegetables. Okay? So I'm going to pass that around and I want you to go home and take this with you, put it on your fridge, put it on your shopping list and be inspired to try something new because I do believe that coffee has a lot of benefits if we know how to use it right. So can I pass that around? Thank you. Now the next plant that I have is Moringa oleifera. Now it's also known as a drumstick tree. It's considered by the World Health Organization as a famine crop because it contains a whole load of nutrients um, and it can grow in a lot of different regions. So it turns out it's a subtropical, tropical plant that grows in nice warm climates um, and grow almost anywhere, but it's ideally suited to places that are very high malnutrition. So it's a place where it will get to the people who need it the most. And when we looked at it, um, and I had a student doing this, she found, uh, this is running through an electron microscope and it's got a detector that records the different elements that are produced from the sample. And what we found was that with the leaf, flower, pods and different teas that we bought, it had lots of different elements, but what we wanted to focus was calcium. Have a look at that. It's got quite a bit of calcium in there, a plant-derived calcium. Now, why is that important? Because we know that calcium, we get our calcium from dairy. Is that right? Hands up if you have dairy, cheese, milk, yogurt. Hands up if you'd like alternatives. Fantastic, because I see the dairy industry as a pretty brutal industry. Um, but that's my opinion. I won't say too much about it. But I would like to have a plant alternative because I think that would be a much nicer um, ethical reason for me. But we have cow's milk, which we know is about 30% absorption. So in terms of availability, now with calcium, the problem is it's usually associated with vitamin D because that helps with absorption. So even though the calcium's there, your body can't absorb it. And a lot of plants, they may have calcium, but they've got phytates or inhibitors that will actually stop you from absorbing it. But when we did a comparison of the literature, we found that there's quite a lot of different plants that do have calcium. Now, broccoli is actually really good in terms of its percentage of absorption. But the problem is it's very low amounts actually um, available. When we looked at Moringa, it's also got about 30% absorption by availability, but it's got a lot more in terms of uh, total, calcium available, uh, total calcium. Now, why is that important? Well, poor bone health costs us a lot of money, from fractures to falls or even hospitalizations. And this is, especially as we get older, what happens is your calcium, if you don't have enough in your diet, you need it for a lot of metabolic processes and your body starts taking it from your bones. And so your bones start to decay and become more brittle. So you do need a lot of that calcium in your diet. But as you grow older, you may not actually like to have more dairy foods. So this is a plant that could actually be something that we could look at in terms of um, diversifying our calcium intake. So we also looked at its effect on cancer. So specifically, we looked on at carcinoma cancer. So we looked at the leaf and the flower and everything else, and we found that it was actually reducing the growth of these cancer cells. And we think it's possibly the glucosinolates that it produces. Now, with Moringa, I've also got a fact sheet. We can grow it in Melbourne, and I've got them growing in Bandura, but it doesn't grow very well unless you give it lots of new uh, fertilizers. 
but you can get it. And online, this is for the vegans, I've got a pea and moringa soup that you can buy the powder pretty much easily online and add it to your diet. Um, there's some specialty farmers around that can give you seed that you can grow. So it's something I'd really like you to take on board in terms of diversifying out your, your different plant exposure. And I'll give that out. In case you haven't noticed, I love the food stuff. I love eating foods and the plants. I'm the first one when I go to these places, I'd say to the farmers, what's that? Can I eat it? <laughs> now, my last plant is my favourite, my personal favourite. This plant I discovered over 15 years ago, and it was by accident. I was walking the market, because I, the first thing I do when I go to a country so I want to go to the market, the farmer's market. I want to know what they're growing. I want to know what they use it for, and I want to try everything. And I saw this really red fruit, orange red fruit, and I said to the farmers, I want to see what's inside. I want to taste it. I want to know what it is. It's completely I've never seen it before. And that's what it looks like on the inside. Now, when I did some research on it, because I thought, this is something I've never seen before. I want to know what it is. We did a literature search, and we found that it used to be very widespread. And it's got common names that are local, indigenous to that region, but it no longer really exists anywhere but Vietnam. So Vietnam only has a wild varieties growing, but Thailand and Malaysia have now started to um, cultivate them in these farms from seeds that I've been sending them. And I think some audience members, I've been sending them out to you as well. So I've had a lot of people contact me to say, how do we get involved? We want to be involved in growing these things so that we can get involved with the, the continuation of this amazing plant. So if you're interested, let me know and I'll send you some, but it, I'll explain why it's not really suitable for, for our climate. It belongs in the cucumber family, so it doesn't like frost. So it's usually found in the tropics, which you can see right across there. And we've tried to grow it and it'll be green, but it won't flower. So New South Wales have started growing them in the glass houses, but I think it's really important when you introduce a plant to grow something that's suited for the climate because if you grow things and it's not suited, you have to add so much to it to make it grow to its end cycle and then you have to waste so much things and I don't think the benefits are outweighing um, the costs. But in literature, we found that it was meant to contain... 70 times the amount of lycopene in tomatoes, 60 times vitamin C in oranges, 28 zeaxanthin in corn, and 10 times the amount of beta carotene. But as a scientist, we really didn't believe any of this. So we did our own studies, <laughs> and we found it was more than 200 times and more than 54 times. And we thought, well, what, why is that the case? Well, it turns out, it depends on where you get it from. So we had New South Wales samples that we tested compared to Thailand samples that they'd started to uh, cultivate, as well as all around Vietnam, and hence my outfit, because I spent a lot of time over there going through the jungles, the forests of markets, and talking to a lot of people and getting their samples. Um, I had to bribe a few people as well, because they had private gardens. And we, we found lycopene and carotene very high in specific regions and specific places. And that's why now we're helping the farmers to actually cultivate these better and make it in an industry so that we can actually use it. Now, did you know that oranges and reds are the main colours we use in our food colouring? We're talking about, I think it was 80-something percent in our juices, in our food, uh, the things that we eat, the candy we give our kids. So food colouring is a big thing. We have pretty much half proportion of natural food colouring and half artificial colouring from petroleum-based colouring. And it's been associated with a lot of attention problems with children. So there's quite a move to more natural colouring, and especially for reds and oranges, this is well suited for that. And it contains so much more than the, the, the colouring that we have at the moment, which means it's a great opportunity for us to have a natural colouring that's not only going to achieve the purposes of what you want, but it's got the benefits. We also looked at eye health. Now, I don't know about you, but I like my eyesight. I'd like to think when I'm older, I can see things. But the reality is, as we get older, our eyes are going to start becoming weaker. 
Now, in a normal eye, you can see things very clearly. But as you get older, things will build up. You develop things like glaucoma where you start to get blurry. And as it gets worse, it gets cataracts. Now, the eyes are the windows to your soul. But it's the only thing that's exposed to the environment, really. Every day we open our eyes, there's wind, there's air, there's sunshine, there's light, all sorts of things coming into our eyes. And that causes a lot of stress. If you think about 80 years every day for, what, eight hours we're awake, maybe? That's a lot of stress. These are these beautiful things that we have that allows us to see. So we need to start looking after it. And the only solutions at the moment for eye disease is laser surgery or injection. Now, both of them gross me out because it's pretty traumatic. It's very painful. I don't know if anyone's ever had eye problems. When you go to the eye and ear hospital, it's very painful. My dad has diabetes and he goes through for glaucoma and he just, he's just like an animal that won't go. We'll have to bribe him into going to get his eyes checked and doing the surgery. But those are the alternatives that we have at the moment. So what we wanted to do was it was supposedly that carotenes are meant, so from the red gag, are meant to be good for the eyes. So we tested on pig cornea and what we found was that so melatonin's the pigment that's responsible for our eyes, was that it, at higher concentrations it started to reduce down the stress of the eyes in terms of the cornea. So glutathione is a, a stress indicator, and we used that to detect whether it was actually reducing the stress on our eyes, and it was. We wanted to look at it that further and find out exactly what is it that's doing it, because I'm a scientist. And in, we know that the only two compounds that accumulate in the eyes is lutein and zeaxanthin. So they're the ones that are responsible for the red and the yellows. Okay? And we did a, a survey of all the different plants that we know that has very high lutein and zeaxanthin compounds in them. Things like, for instance, the watermelon strawberry, very high in that red colour. Okay? Parsley, broccoli, kale, and marigolds, for instance, in the yellows. And we found that the red gag, the mamortica fruit, was far surpassing the rest. So if you look at those, that's like a thousand times more than everything else. So what we did was we extracted it out using different uh, solvents to specifically take out the lutein and zeaxanthin. And we tested it against retinal cells. So the cells are responsible for your retina. And we found that without anything, so under normal conditions, it's in the black with the CA, which is control. And then when we stressed it with hydrogen peroxide, it went all the way down. So the cells started dying in masses. But when we added red gag, which is the mamortica plant that we're talking about, it started to be, it started to heal and come up. So that was very exciting for us because eye diseases are a big problem. And I thought I'd put these numbers down because you don't really see the impact because it's not, we're all quite, well, I'm quite healthy. It doesn't, I don't see it as a problem yet, but it's a problem for a lot of people in the world and it will be a problem for us as we get older. So this is something that could be um, useful for us to take uh, control of now because all these eye diseases are going to keep increasing as we get older. We also looked at its anti-cancer activity. Um, now these are melanoma cells, both melanoma, carcinoma and breast cancer cells, and we found that different varieties from different regions, again, was reducing it down to about, uh, so reducing cancer cells 60% growth. So it's not killing them, but it's reducing enough so it's not at 100%. And when we looked at why it was doing it, we were finding that, um, so on the left-hand side here, the control, the cells are all nice and round, but on the left-hand side, they're starting to disintegrate from the inside out. So the compounds are killing the cancer cells from the inside out. We looked at um, apoptosis, which is one main way of cells dying, and we looked at morphologies and we uh, dyed them with different stains to show the apoptosis. So we had uh, Fitzy and different stains that looked at different pathways of death. 
um, and we looked at scanning electron microscopes and TM, so it's a transmission electron microscopes. So we wanted to not only see the pathways that was dying, but also the morphology of how it was doing it through the cells. And I've also been uh, working with University of, Newcastle, um, University of Queensland, who specialise in cyclotides, and we know the function of these little proteins that actually go into the cells and how it works with um, breaking up different um, compounds and using it for different applications. So it's more the nanoparticle structures and, and micromorphology rather than what we can see with our eyes. Um, so with a lot of the technologies, I mean, apoptosis is a very well-known, well-studied pathway. Um, looking at uh, microscopy, it's also quite well-studied. So we followed what a lot of others have found in terms of or what others have used in terms of explaining why things happen the way they do. Now, as part of my sustainability is we didn't want to use the fruit only for the, the red part, the, the shell covering. We wanted to look at the seed as well because the seed is what's thrown away. And most of the fruit, the arrow, which is the red part, is only about 30% and the seed is about 50%. So it's thrown away a lot of it. We're also using other parts to also look at how we can upcycle the waste components. Now, the seed had even more bioactivity. We're talking about 90 to 95% effectiveness against these melanoma cells. And when we looked at the mechanism, we were finding it was even more effective than the other, the arrow, in eating the cells from the inside out so that it was almost nothing left. And when we ran a protein gel on it to find out what was actually responsible, we found these very small proteins of about 20 to 20 to 37 kilodaltons. And we suspect that it's called these cyclotides because we've been working with a group in University of um, Queensland. Now, all these plants from these different families, we've found that they contain these cyclotides. The cyclotides are very round, small amino acid proteins and they contain these two sulfide bonds that help it to keep its structure. So it's very strong, it's very stable, and it's small, and it's bioactive. And what Queensland has done is with the violaceae family, so the viola, is they've developed a pesticide treatment, a natural pesticide. But there's not that much known with our fruit, but there's so much potential for it because it contains these really small proteins that are so bioactive. When I was getting my student to work on the red gag, she's Vietnamese. And this red gag is from Vietnam. And when I said to her, I want you to work on this project, because she came to me with no project. And I said to her, I'd like you to work on this project. And she said to me, this is a very common fruit. It has no benefit. I don't want to work on it. And I said to her, OK, why don't you try it anyway? Because if, if it doesn't prove to be beneficial, the minimum you have is your degree. You've got very little to lose. And by the end of the, I think, second month, I changed her mind. She was so ready to do it. She said, I think this plant is amazing. I was wrong to see it as every, because she said to me, my family thinks it's useless. My friends think it's useless. This plant couldn't, we have it every day to color our rice. It couldn't possibly have medicinal applications. You know, it's got no value. And yet, here we are several years down the track and we've come up with um, carotenoids that are higher than anything we've ever seen, anti-cancer properties, you know, we've got proteins that are very bioactive and she's just been blown away with the amount of technology and the information that science can give you with these very simple plants that's been used for centuries for something very simple like colouring rice. Oh, I forgot to do the, the, the recipe. Now... <laughs> This recipe is my own. So I make it for my partner tea. So it's uh, spicy chicken wings, and I also do uh, red gack uh, sweet potato, baked sweet potato. Unfortunately, you can't really get red gack in Australia. Um, the primary producers have asked me to be the main exporter, and I said, I'm a scientist. I know nothing about that, so I can't help you. But if anyone's interested, come and see me later in the talk because I'd really like this to be available. I do believe in it in terms of we've, we've seen so much from it um, that I think it's worthwhile we at least make an available option for Australians. Um, 
I've looked at a few Asian grocery stores and they do have frozen samples, but it's not very good in terms of we tested the bioavailability, but something happens in the processing stages. So th there's a few warnings with it in terms of it's not at the best um, source that you can get, but I think it could actually be improved. And I'd really like you, the general public, to be the main supporters of this to help me move, make that movement in terms of getting this to the best it can be so we can benefit from it. So here's the recipe. I don't know, if you, I think you can order the powder online, but I haven't tested the powder, so I really, I'm not sure what bioactivity it is. But I've also got samples, Renee's told me, um, of red gack oil, and I've got some bread that you can dip into to try and see if it's something you could support. Um, it's like olive oil, but it's, you know, I put it on my uh, salads, for instance, as a little vinaigrette thing, and it's just lovely. You couldn't tell it's there. It's meant to taste like avocado. So it's good for diabetics, um, but you can't really get the fresh flesh here. So I'm going to pass that out and a bit of growing conditions. So if you're interested in growing them, let me know because I would send you some seeds. Now I'd like us to take a moment to reflect on the three plants that I've shown you. They're not the only plants that are available, and I really believe that the plants are our medicine. And there's so much potential within them. And as I've shown you, a lot of these plants, we take it for granted just, you know, that it tastes good, it smells nice, and we we'll just drink it. But the potentials behind it, the medicines behind it are huge. Okay? Um, and why is that important to you? I'd really like you to reflect in terms of what this means to you. And I've got some numbers and data there because I really do believe if we take ownership of our own health, then we have control of what happens later on. Okay? Now, being healthy, our life expectancy in 100 years ago was only about 40, 50. But medicine's gone a long way in the last 100 years. And now we're averaging about 80 years old. And like I said before, 80 years is a long time for a machine to work without any upgrades. Sometimes I get up in the morning and my bones are aching and I think, oh, that must be what our ageing is like. But it will get worse. But I think we have a few solutions. But living well in terms of good health is very expensive. We're talking about billions and it will only keep in increasing. I believe that in order to make a difference, the first step is believing it yourself, making those steps and making it believable to others. And by word of mouth and by people looking at you and seeing your practices, they can see how easy it is and they can take on board and amplify that through their networks. We're only separated by, what, six degrees of freedom. If I do something really well, I will tell six people and those six people will tell their six people. And through the power of networking, I think that would be making a much better difference than me just doing my own keeping a secret. So I'd like you to take this mantra home, is that if we eat well and we've got lots of options, we can live well and we can be well, not just for today but for tomorrow. And this is something we can all contribute towards our own health. Share it with your friends and your family so that we can be responsible for our own future. Thank you. Just in regards to the red gack oil you mentioned, have, uh, are you planning to do any research on the oil? Because I know it tends to change if uh, temperatures of oil, like olive oil, is okay to uh, fry in, um, but what well, cook you cook cook with? But what about red gack oil? Have you uh, any research yet on why you're planning to? So with the red, oh, this is with the red gack. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. With red gag, we've only really looked at its uh, native form. So we haven't, because once you had add heat to things, it does change the conformation um, of the compounds. And so what we're finding, so with the, the sweet potato, for instance, I added on last, so it doesn't change with the temperature. Um, but we do know carotenoids, uh, the orange is specifically very, they're very heat stable, but I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. 
only because we've seen a lot of changes once you put heat to it. I think I've got questions coming up. Okay, what, I've got a question here. Sorry, I'll answer the question here. What links or websites can you suggest to keep ourselves well informed in regards to medicinal plants, recipes and where to get them in Melbourne? Well, the internet's full of a lot of stuff. I always usually trust the um, uh, academic sites or government sites. Um, recipes, in that regard, like I said, I always try and avoid the ones that use a lot of cooking, uh, heat, because I think with plants, the natural products exist naturally. Once you add heat to it or you put different environments that it belongs there, you know, like heat or different acids and stuff, it changes its natural existence. And so for me, I, I see plants as a solution, but the things that we do to it, we've got to give it respect. So the Vietnamese diet, I would highly recommend. We have a lot of very raw salads. Um, we don't cook that much with it. We have very little meat. Um, so it's mostly vegetables. And if you're, you live near Bandura, we have organic gardens that I like to involve the community, get my students involved, and everyone can come in and pick whatever they want, grow whatever they want. Um, we have a, medis a, a Chinese medicinal garden where we teach the students how to respect plants and, and the medicine that can come from it. Um, so I, look, I think in terms of eating well, the problem at the moment is we, um, one of the things that I saw was I went out to the primary schools and what devastated me was when I asked the students, the kids, where does your food come from? And they said to me, in the supermarket in a plastic bag. And I made a commitment to try and change that. Bring them out to the gardens and show them the plants and treat them with respect. And that way, they'll, t they'll use less and waste less. So for me, I, I, I care a lot about the plants, but it's also about their sustainability because we live in a very wasteful society because we don't grow things, so we don't really appreciate the work and effort that goes into it. But I would really recommend everyone to try and grow your own plants. And if, if you want to, I can grow them for you and take the seedlings home. Because if you grow it, you, you develop a sense of, belonging with your plant and you're not as wasteful with it. I know that if I go and buy a bunch of herbs from the supermarket, I'm not going to use half of it. But if I grow them in my garden, I'll only pick one or two little twigs and use that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's all about that psychology in terms of being aware of what you grow, what you consume, what you waste. So websites... University websites, government websites, there's quite a few around. Um, but in terms of the internet, there's a lot of things that may not tell you the truth. There's a lot of fiction out there. So do be careful. Um, I mean, I, I do these tests with all the machines that we know are standardised and I can rely on it. And I'm lucky that I work with amazing people who this is their profession with all the nutrition nutritionists and dietitians. And they tell me all these things. And it's like, oh, I tried this. And we all get into this whole frenzy with cooking, eating. Because I, what I used to do is I had this movement with my department. said, we're going to have potluck day. I'm going to bring in salads. Everyone's going to learn how to make a salad every month. And it's going to be nutritious salad. No cooking involved. And at the beginning, a lot of them were like, oh, you can't eat a salad and be full. But I changed their minds. And now they incorporate it into their own foods and it's not too, too mystical. And that's why I've got some taste tests down there. So I've got red gack um, oil that you can try. So it breaks down that mystery. So you're open to trying it. And I've also got um, moringa tea that you can drink, which is everyone drinks tea. It's not too weird. More question? Good evening. Thank you Good for day. your talk. Um, with respect to coffee in particular, um, uh, you're talking about the benefits through drinking coffee, uh, I, I imagine. Can you achieve the same benefits through taking coffee into the body in other ways? And without being terribly gross about it, um, a little while ago, it might still be you know, um, popular, I don't know, uh, 
there was a lot of talk about the benefits of coffee enemas, for instance, and health benefits associated with that as a way of taking it into the body more directly. And I, I, I don't, I, again, I haven't participated in this, but I know there was a lot of talk about it. And similarly with garlic as well. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, and, and going to the point of using more of the plant, um, are there other ways that you can consume coffee, uh, for instance, other than consuming it by way of a hot drink? Great question. Thank you. Uh, entertaining, but great as well. <laughs> so the coffee we drink is drinking. So the recipe I've given you is a whole coffee itself. As a, so you're not just drinking the liquid from it. You're, you're using the whole thing. I do know that there's a lot of anti-aging coffee products. So there's, there's a few truths to it in terms of it does wound heal. Um, and I know they have mud baths in Asia. They do a lot of it in terms of you can get these coffee masks and you absorb it through the skin. Um, they also have uh, coffee, different coffee cosmetics. So they have dyes to it, but you still have the coffee to, to add on yourself. So Vietnam's actually, well, not just Vietnam, Asia in general, they've got a lot of different products that are available, but I haven't tested them, so I don't know if it's any good. But there's studies that do suggest it could be used other ways. But this is where we need people to start demanding for it, saying, what else can we do with this? I mean, it's just so easy to go to a coffee shop and drink it, but you don't think of what we could do with that waste. Mm -hmm. So what we've been doing, and this is a completely different topic, we've been using the coffee waste to grow fungi. And one of my other research projects, and I'm here again next week talking about fungi, is we, we produce these um, uh, fire-resistant bricks for the building industry. I've got a student growing um, plastic alternative using fungi from, that grown from the coffee. So it's all kind of related somehow. Um, and we're going to use... because. Uh, in a lot of cosmetics, uh, we have emulsifiers and um, stabilizers in there. We could replace the, the fungi with that grown from coffee. So there's a lot of really innovative ways to use things. And it's amazing the things that we can do now with technology, is, and especially with engineering and science, we can actually transform these raw products to things that are really important for us now and in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about genetics. So first of all, the plant side, uh, you mentioned the variation in different regions and just wondered if you could say anything about the possible genetic variation. And then the second part is the human side. So for example, I know I don't have the genes to metabolize caffeine. So if I drink it late at night, I'm awake. So the kind of what the pharmacogenomic side. And I wondered if either sides of, of, those, sort of those investigations have been a part of your studies and if you could say anything about that. So we have published something with the genetic side of the plants. We do know that they're very different and we looked at um, metabolomics as well as gene expression. Um, the plants from Vietnam are very different. So is from so Vietnam samples there, they're highly variable, very diverse. And that's why we, su we suspect that's the original wild varieties because they haven't been cultivated. The ones in... Um, India, they're tiny. We think it's a different species altogether. And it certainly doesn't contain the arrow that you can use commercially. The ones in Thailand, they're small. So to give you an idea, the Vietnam varieties can range from one kilo to four kilos, which means the fruit is about that big. Apparently, if it falls in your head, you die, because it's got these spikes. It's a bit like durian. And so when I'm walking these farms, they tell me to wear a hat. Um, and... The ones in Thailand, they're about half a kilo, and it's really hard to take open the arrow and the, the seed inside. The ones in um, New South Wales, we linked it to southern Vietnam varieties, so there's a relationship, genetic relationship there. Um, in terms of the pharmacogenetics, oh, we also did the genetics for the uh, Moringa. They were very similar, and the reason is because we think the Moringa is actually uh, was planted from cuttings, and they're very very low diversity. Um, with coffee, we didn't look at the genetics with that because we know the farms are all quite different in terms of their breeds and especially where we were collecting them from because I would always go to the farm and not to the coffee shops. Um, they're all looking at different varieties for climate change to, to cope with the different environments that's going to be, uh, they're going to face later on. 
Um, with the pharmacogenetics, we haven't done much with that in terms of adding the complexity of human interaction with the plants is something that's important. I think if you want to look into it, we can definitely give you examples and help you to set that up. But for me, it's been really a challenge looking at the, the waste applications because that's where I see the opportunity. And especially getting that sort of stuff out in terms of extracting it out to get the best compounds because there's so many ways you can do it wrong. Not just extracting it, but processing it, freezing it, drying it, doing all sorts of stuff and doing the right anal analytics. Um, we want to be sure that we're treating these plants with respect, but we want to keep them in the native form. You got one on there? Yes. So the second question was, I'm interested in the cancer-killing activity in vitro was specific to cancer cells and didn't harm non-cancer cells. So for red gag, the arrow didn't harm normal cells. So we compared that relative to normal cells. With the Cs, it did harm normal cells, I think about uh, either 30 or 70%. So it did kill some cells, but not to the level where it was killing the cancer cells. Um, with the Moringa, it was, didn't kill the cancer cells. The coffee, did we do ca uh, cancer? I can't remember with the coffee. I have to look back my notes. Can I get back to you on that? But most of the plants that we looked at, it was quite good with normal cells. Last question? No. Oh, there's quite a lot of questions. Do you believe the Moringa and GAC can be grown successfully in North Queensland? I think it could. I've sent some samples to the farmers in Queensland, but I've never heard back from them. Oh, no, well, no, that's not, not true. They did respond once. They said there was a cyclone hitting. We're not sure we can continue to... <laughs> this, is, this is... Yeah, so I do send a lot of samples to the farmers in Queensland because it's... it's, a, it's well, with the red gag, it can grow in a lot of different environments, specifically dry, in, uh, dry, uh, um, dry conditions, so it's drought-tolerant. Um, but it does like, the, uh, does like the water to flower well. Um, but the Queensland farmers, they've had a lot of really disturbances in the environment. So it, it's a plant that's, it's a vine, and so it's very subject to wind conditions, and once that happens, all the flowers just fall off. Um, so I think they've had a few issues with getting the environment to agree, but that's something that's going to always be variable. Yeah, yeah so I, I, I'm very keen to support the Australian farmers and look at alternatives, because if we can get it grown here... That would be really good. But um, from what I've seen, I think there's a few farmers in Bali who have asked me to send them seeds. Um, but they've had problems with in insects because with plants, when you take them outside of their natural environment, you're going to face a lot of problems, including its natural, uh, uh, natural um, predators. And what happens is when it's taken away from its normal environment, one, you've got to do the, get the right soil, the right environment, and its predators. And they're having a lot of um, insects eating the fruits. So it's, it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. That gives us hope, I think, for the future. Oh, it's very exciting. Yes. So I'd like to ask Dr. Sophia Ferenc from our council to propose the vote of state. Thank you so much for all of that, Chen. I have never been so excited to have fact sheets from a lecture. Um, and so as the representative of the Royal Society of Victoria, we are so happy to have had you here tonight talking to all of us. And I'd like to provide you with a vote of thanks on behalf of the society. I think I respect my food more. I cook a lot less in terms of putting heat to, to, to foods. Um, but I, I've also gravitated more towards my Vietnamese um, dietary um, meals and things like that because the Vietnamese food, and I've been to a lot of countries and eaten local foods, and I see the benefits of um, heat, not having heat cook your vegetables. Um, and I would actually prefer foods and fruits and vegetables raw. And that's where, with the research, I can see the natural products before they're cooked up and I know that if I eat them fresh, it's natural. And I haven't altered it in any way. And I'm going to get the best benefit from it. 